Good morning, Charlie. <clears throat> good morning, Alyssa. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good heavens. Good morning, Jayla. Um, good morning, Daniela. Hold on. I am awesome, awesome. Good morning, Newell. Or did I just say that? Sorry. No, I didn't. Good morning, Newell. Awesome. Um, and good morning. Good morning, Vivian. Um, good, uh, who, okay, who else? Oh, and good morning, Alyssa, I think. Or did I already say? Oh, I did say that. Okay. Good morning, Charlie. Good morning, Alyssa. Good morning, Daniela. Good morning, Newell. Good morning, Vivian. Okay, I think. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Small group today, it seems. Or I guess we're a little bit not late. Um, I had a friend, I had a student a long, 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 long time ago um, in Louisiana whose father lived in Texas. And uh, one time the kid uh, like rushed on, his dad was kind of strict and not really cool, but really intimidating. And, uh, oh wait, someone's here. And one time the kid ran, I mean, he was a kid at the time, ran to his dad's house, like rang the doorbell. He was supposed to be there at noon and it was like, um, and it was like 11.59 or something. And he rang the doorbell and the dad came and the dad said, uh, hello. And the son was like all out of breath and all like intense for making sure that he hadn't messed up. And he's like, hi, hi, dad. Hi, dad. I think I'm, I'm not late. I'm not late. And the dad just goes, where I come from, son, we call that on time. To this day, I don't actually understand that, but for some reason, I like it. Okay. Um, oh, and good morning. Who just, uh, oh, so, okay. Okay. We are going to start. We are going to start. We are going to pick up from where we were last time. Um, yes. In fact, we'll do, okay. Um, new homeworks have been, I mean, we're all almost caught up with ourselves, which is good. Good morning. Oh, someone's still coming. Okay. We're like, I think pretty much almost caught up with ourselves. I still owe you guys back one homework now, which is train of thought. Like many of you did it, which is great. You haven't gotten it back yet. I think all of you have gotten everything else back. I think, I hope, I believe. Um, so now, and we're going to finish today discussing the conclusions that come from train of thought, from that discussion, that brief discussion we had last time. Um, 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 um. Um, so we're going to get to the conclusion from that, and it's and it looks like a sort of philosophical conclusion. It is. I mean, it changed the world. This conclusion, um, but it also has major, major decisive impact on problem solving, on quantitative problem solving for the rest of physics. Even though it may not look like that at first. I mean, basically, what we're discussing here is the idea that the Earth moves even though we don't feel it. Like that's what we're discussing, that the earth moves even though we don't feel it. And what's that all about? And why did it take us hundreds and, or thousands of years to even come to the conjecture, let alone the conclusion, or the ability to say that the earth moves even when we don't feel it? How can it be possible to not feel a vessel when it's moving as fast as we believe the earth to be moving? I should say moving past the sun. Um, what it really turns out is the idea that we could even ever say that relative to anything the earth is moving at, say, for example, 65,000 miles an hour tells us not some, it tells us something really important about the earth. And it tells us something really important about the structure of the universe, um, like literally uh, the structure of the universe, the shape um, and the contents and the patterns and the principles underlying the universe. But it also, on a very simple but uh, level, tells us what we mean by motion. It tells us a lot about what we mean by velocity or speed. And it tells us things about velocity and speed that aren't just, I shouldn't say just, but aren't philosophical or aren't abstract. They are as mathematical and as practical as any definition of the term or any equation. Velocity, oops, so someone's coming. So what I'm trying to just quickly say in summary is the reason we took the sort of left turn and started talking about a train is an analogy to planet Earth. Planet Earth, however, in the end, 
is an analogy to or an example of any train or any plane or any rocket ship or any walking or any elevator you would ever be in or watch any the truth of the matter is we're looking at a hypothetical train in order to tell us something about the actual real planet earth which in turn tells us something about what we mean by motion in general which vastly is going to affect the equation someone else is here sorry all the equations all the problems that we're going to solve all physics to come, whether it's in this course, in physics 204, the next course, or honestly, in any contemporary or modern physics course like the, about contents that come after 1905 and after Einstein, and after physics really explodes into some interesting um, implications, it all actually stems, I honestly, stems from the relative or the relational character of velocity that is what we're probing right now. The actual, like how velocity actually works, what it means when we say that something. Oh, good morning. Thank you so much. Good morning. Oh, and uh, good morning, so on. Also, good morning, Farouk. Sorry. And also, I think that's it. Yes. And good morning, Farouk. And good morning, so on. Thank you. Um, so we are, so again, the train is perhaps fake, or at least in our imagination, but it represents the earth, which represents any real train you've ever been in or any real elevator you've ever been in. And all of those things represent the, the, na the nature of motion in general, which is like totally what we're here to study. And when I say the nature of motion or when I say the character of velocity, and I will get back to the board in a second, I really mean, I do mean in a philosophical and geographical and astronomical and religious and historical and political way, but I also mean in a directly mathematical, practical, nitty gritty way, like what the heck is velocity and how does it work? It will affect our problem solving for the next two homeworks and beyond and the next two homeworks to come full circle have been posted. Um, they're due a week from today and we're gonna actually probably start going over one. We may. Honestly, start going, then we're gonna flip things now that you've we've all caught up with each other pretty much. And the next homework, homework four is do a week from today, but we may start, I may start helping you with it even before then, because I think we're just about up to it. Um, and then the one after that, do a week from this Wednesday. Um, so they're quantitative, they'll require some thought, just like the old ones, you can hand in revisions and updates at any time. Even if you don't get all the points at first, you can get the points later. Also, on that note, let me congratulate and thank many of you. No worries, no worries. Totally cool. I appreciate it. Uh, ooh, I actually see what. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Oh, I bet other people are coming. Okay, thank you. Thank you, direct chat person. Totally understood. And I have a feeling the direct chat person is not only speaking for him or herself. I bet it applies to other people. So thank you. Um, uh, uh, the homeworks that are posted, right. Um, like they're due next week. Again, you, oh, you can take as long as you like with them to revise. Da -da -da -da. I think you'll be getting more insights into them, into class, but also let me congratulate and thank the people. There are people in this room who did do revisions on homework. One, like they didn't get a full 20 points on homework one, but then they did revision revisions on it there's at least one person in this room who did revisions twice who like handed in got more points and then handed in again to get even more points i just wanted to, and those people i believe have gotten back their revisions and gotten 20s now as a result of the revisions just say i mean right now i'm not going to get into names or anything but just saying like even if i'm always a little bit behind whatever the system hopefully does work like you could just keep handing in as long as you have the energy and the time, and as long as you don't fall behind, you could just keep doing things until you get perfect scores on everything except for exams. Um, okay, um, or oh, and labs. Uh, okay, so thank you for doing that. And I hope you saw that you got your points back. You know who you are. Uh, and, and that still applies to anybody. Anybody can still revise homework one. We're not like, like I think we've moved on, but like it's as long as the portal is there, you can use the portal. Um, for that matter, also, all the October 1 portals have been changed to November 1. That was never supposed to be a time pressure thing that was just supposed to keep. So anything that ever said October 1 now says November 1. So keep, you know. OK. Uh, OK, uh, so we're going to go. We are going to go. What I'm going to write down now on the next page. Oh, yeah. What I'm going to write down now on the next page, I'm going to pick Again, we have this whole like debate, like is a train moving or not? Is a train that seems sort of motionless moving or not? Again, I ultimately said it's an analogy to planet Earth. I keep, by the way, I keep putting planet in quotes, not because I'm like a weirdo. Well, I'm sure that is part of the reason, but 
I just, I mean, I don't want to, I, oh, I, nah. I can easily, I love this whole question of the earth. I'm even going to pause for a second to show you something. But if I'm not careful, I could get bogged down and talk about the earth and astronomy and motion in that sense for the rest of the semester, if I'm not careful. Like, I guess that would be called an astronomy class, but I don't mean to do that. But I, so I want to be careful, but I want to stress the reason I keep putting the word planet in quotes is planet means wanderer. It means point in the sky, point of light that moves through the sky. The, the seven original planets, the seven objects in the sky that we originally called planets are the seven objects in the sky after which we named the seven days of the week, okay? And not one of them is Earth. Oh, oh no, sorry. No, sorry, I totally didn't see that. Sorry, I didn't even see that. Okay. okay. Not one of the original seven planets was Earth. Earth was not considered a planet because planet didn't mean whatever we think planet means now. It didn't mean like rocky terrain with possible life supporting blah, 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 blah. It meant a point of light in the sky that actually moved relative to all the other points of light in the sky. That is to say, moved relative to the constellations, the groups of stars, which always remain remained and remain fixed to one another uh, from our perspective that, okay, I'm gonna say this now, as long as I'm bringing this up at all. Like, please note, like, even though, if you've ever looked at the stars in the sky, ever, ever, like for a minute or ideally maybe for an hour, you may or may not know all the stars in the sky do move from east to, certainly if you're facing south, they all move from east to west every night, just the same way that the sun appears to rise in the east and set in the west. Like all the stars do move, but, they move to, and whether or not you knew that it's the case, but they all move together. That is to say, if you happen to know that you were born in October, it, well, if you happen, if you know when you were born and you happen to be like, oh, I was born in October, therefore people have told me that I'm a Libra or something like that. Whether or not you believe that that means anything, da, 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 but if you just know, or if you've ever heard of even like the Big Dipper or any group of, or Orion's Belt, if you've heard of any group of stars ever, in the sky, any constellation, and most of the ones that most people have heard about are the zodiac constellations like Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, like those, right? If you've heard of it, just stop and think about this for one second. I mean, I don't want to get too bogged down, but this is, this is all about the relational character of velocity. If you've ever heard of any group of stars at all, then think about, and, and if you've heard, oh, it's supposed to look like a spoon or the shape of the stars looks like a fish or something, good. no problem. Thank you very much. Good morning. No problem. No problem. Um, just note for the record that if anybody ever says that group of stars looks like a fish, you might say that's ridiculous. It doesn't look like a fish. It actually looks like a, like a paramecium or something. You might think it's ridiculous that someone thinks it looks like a fish, but the point, the important point is that there's a shape to those stars. You can say, oh, my birth sign doesn't look like two scales. It looks like a Rorschach blob. Well, fine, call it a Rorschach blob if you want, or call it a paramecium, or call it just a dumb triangle. But the point is that that triangle that you associate with that group of stars is what it's gonna look like tomorrow. And the next day, the next day, in other words, it always looks like a triangle. And that's true. It looked like a triangle 2000 years ago. And it'll look like, at least to us on earth, and it'll look like a triangle or whatever you call it 2000 years from now. And what's my point in saying that? My point in saying that is think that means that all the stars are sticking together. They're staying in a shape. If they move, if one of them moved relative to another, right? If one star actually moved relative to another, then the shape would not stay a shape. No one would call it anything. And the Greeks wouldn't have called, right? But the fact that we can all look at them and say, oh yeah, the Greeks called that a scorpion, a, a, a scorpion. Again, you could say, I don't think it's a scorpion, but the point is you're looking at the same shape that the Greeks or the Romans or the Mesopotamians or the Chinese or the whomever, the, the Hebrews, whatever they were looking at, you're looking at because the shape does not change. 
the stars will stay in formation relative to one another, even as they all move across the sky as one big map. That's why we can all talk about the 12 constellations of the zodiac as though we are all talking about the same thing because we are, because those groups do stay as groups, just like the maps of the country on the surface of planet Earth, right? Like, I don't care if you think America looks like a blob or a bleeb, but like we all know what America looks like because it doesn't drift and break apart. And like Maine doesn't start like continentally drifting away from New York over our lifetime. It, right, the stars maintain, the constellations maintain their shape relative to one another. All those points of light, the thousand or 1500 points of light that you can see every night with a naked eye if you don't live in New York City, right? They all stay together. But there are seven points of light seven that you can see i'm totally off on a tangent now i'm going to bring it back in a second but it's just like so it makes the point to me so vividly there are seven points of light that if you pay attention long enough and get to know the stars well enough as the greeks did as the romans did as the hebrews did as the mesopotamians did etc the mayans the Hindu, whomever everybody the hindus if you pay attention to those constellations and watch them rise in the east every night and set in the west and you get to know their patterns you find eventually that there are exact out of the 1500 that you can see with your eyes naked eyes like no telescopes no fancy schmancy blah, 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 blah. of those 1500 that you see with your naked eye seven of them are drifting compared to all the other 1500 and compared to one another seven, exactly seven, move on their own paths. Those seven is what engage the curiosity and the wonder and the awe of anybody ever looking at the stars for millennia, because for some reason, every star is doing the same thing that, as every other star, this whole group, this whole canopy, but seven of them are wandering on their own apparent paths. They are the seven exceptions that is that suggest some sort of larger rule about outer space, about the universe. Like they engage the curiosity and the wonder of everybody forever. Some people call them gods, some people didn't. But those seven are the sun and the moon. The sun, and you might say the sun and the moon, well, duh, obviously they're different. Well, fine, yeah, the sun's really big and bright and the moon's really big and bright and goes through big. But the point is the sun and the, so they're, they were called major planets because yeah, they're obviously different in some way. They're super big, but they move on their own paths, the sun and the moon. Sunday, Monday. And then the other five are Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. No one knew that those things were made of rock or gas or anything like that. They don't look any different from the other 1500. They just move on their own paths. That's why they were called planets, wanderers. The seven original planets are sun, moon, Mercury, after which Wednesday is named, um, uh, Venus, after which uh, uh, Friday is named, um, Mars, after which Tuesday is named, um, Jupiter, after which Thursday is named, and Saturn, after which Saturday is named. And when I say after which I'm named, if you don't believe me or if you don't know what I'm talking about, first of all, think in Spanish or French. You'll see it immediately. If you ever have taken Spanish or French, think of it that way. Or think of it in, um, I mean, um, well, yeah, think of it or, or some other like romance language. If you think of the names of the days of the week in a romance language, you'll immediately see that they're named after these seven astronomical objects. Those are the seven original planets. Those are the seven things in the sky that move relative to everything else. The earth was not one of them. And because the earth does not move relative to anything else, so it seems, right? That's what we're here to discuss. Um, um, and, and also, for whatever it's worth, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto were not among that list either because you can't see those without telescopes. No one knew about them until the 1800s. Um, okay, wait. Okay, that, so that's a, what, what's my point? Uh, well, my ultimate, what is my point actually? Well, oh, my point is that's why I keep calling the Earth. Whenever I say the Earth is a planet, I put in quotes because the Earth is like, it's very, very modern, very, very contemporary notion to refer to the Earth as a planet. Like planet originally means thing that moves. Once you call it a planet, you're saying that it moves. To the idea that it moves as fast as it seemingly does without feeling it at all is one of the mis... It, to understand how you could believe that you could stand on a floor that is sliding past the sun at 65,000 miles an hour all the time 
while the sun slides past the galactic center at 650,000 miles an hour all the time was for the longest time one of the mysteries of the universe and now is resolvable mystery only if we actually really redefine or properly define what we mean by velocity. That's what Galileo did. That's what he did in Galileo's principle. So I'm now going to rewrite Galileo's principle. I, I finished the class last Monday, um, last Wednesday, by writing Galileo's principle in the first, what we're calling form number one. I'm going to write it again right now. Please do write it again with me. I want you to get to know it super well. It comes up in many different forms in his different books. He didn't necessarily refer to them as form one, form two, or whatever. I mean, first of all, he wasn't writing in English anyway, but we do. We're gonna, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna give you form one again. And I'm gonna give you form two again. I'm just gonna write them again and we're briefly remind you what we said. And then we're gonna move on today and move to form three and possibly form four. And form four, there's seven of them, of the, of the forms, but form four is what will transition us and show you how this all relates back to the math and the problem solving that we're trying to do. Okay, so I'm gonna, so sorry about that little thing, um, uh, but I'm gonna write down, Galileo's. So again, I'm going to pick up here by writing down. And thank you, everybody in direct message. Totally thank you. I totally get it. Thank you. I'm going to write down again the last two things I said in the last class. Please write them again with me. They're that important. It's form one and form. And please know again, this is all Galileo's principle of relativity. It's not a physics law. It comes before physics laws. All the laws of physics come from this principle. Okay. And it's not seven different laws. It's one, it's not seven different principles. It's one principle that has different ways of saying it. And each next way of saying it opens up new understanding for physics. So, okay. So, and, and but the word is relativity here. If you've ever, ever heard of anything like Einstein's theory of relativity, Einstein's special theory of relativity, Einstein, then yeah, same word and not a coincidence. Everything you've ever even heard about Einstein and Einstein's obviously the man, like I love Einstein, who doesn't love Einstein? Every, in fact, I think that picture of Einstein's face, I, I believe that picture of Einstein's face has been reprinted. In, at least last time I checked statistically, you could probably Google this. I believe that's been reprinted on more t-shirts than any other image of any other face on the whole planet besides possibly Mickey Mouse and Jesus. Like I honestly, I think that picture of Einstein with the tongue, I think that is more reprinted everywhere on the planet on t-shirts than Mickey Mouse, than anything except maybe Mickey Mouse and Jesus, which tells you something. But anyway, this relativity idea originally comes from Galileo and Einstein didn't steal it. Einstein literally attributed it his, I mean, uh, another digression, but if you've ever heard about anything weird about space and time and twin, one twin being older than another and going into black holes and all this stuff, which I completely believe in is totally part of physics and I love, it all, it's Einstein in, in a paper in 1905 saying explicitly that this conjecture of Galileo's, Einstein begins to call, the, it's Einstein that begins to call it the principle of relativity and he elevates it to the level of a postulate, so to speak, like, but so if you're interested in Einstein or interested in modern physics, it starts right here with Galileo with the principle of relativity, which arguably is, I mean, is published in different forms in different books, but arguably is published for the first time in 1626 in a book called Starry um, The Starry Messenger. It's written originally uh, in Italian and translated to Latin. In every form,
Okay, I'm going to give you a second to go. I know you copied this lesson. I'm going to give you, and you'll even notice that every time I write one of these forms, I write it slightly differently each time, partly to remind us all they were not written in English in the first place. So, I mean, there's a million, there's more than one way to say them right. There's a million ways to say them wrong, but there is more than one way to say them right. The idea is to get the exact, I mean, the idea is to use words that we actually understand in order to convey them. But um, so, so one thing I'm saying right now is, the principle of relativity in general, what it's all about with the different books that Galileo published in different contexts, um, they're all ultimately about this ultimate subject of like whether the earth is moving or not. And you could boil down these different forms of the principle in a way to saying, I mean, the claim, I have to be very careful, the ultimate claim of Galileo is not the earth is moving and I can prove it. It's not that. It's a total shifting of the whole question. The claim is just because we don't feel the earth moving doesn't mean it's not moving. We're not actively saying that it's moving. In fact, we're changing our definition of motion or adjusting it to embrace the fact that actually motion, is, what you're gonna see, motion is a comparison, not, a, not an absolute description. So what we're saying here is, look, you can't say that the earth is not moving. You can't say that. You cannot say the earth is definitively stationary or definitively not moving. And especially you can't say it if your only evidence or your main evidence is that you don't feel it moving. That's what we're gonna ultimately try to say here is that you don't feel motion. Feeling motion is not evidence of motion. That's where we're ultimately get. So, but form one, the what's the, the form one, like we said last time is, or one way to put it is the laws of physics whatever they're gonna be, are the same at all constant velocities. Please understand when I say that. I want it to be clear, Galileo worked in the, in the early um, you know, uh, 17th century in Italy, or what we would now call Italy. Galileo died in 1642. Newton was born on Christmas of 1642 and died 1727. Why am I bringing this up? Well, because everybody's heard of Newton and everybody's heard of Newton's laws of motion. And that's what we're gonna get into next in this class for sure. I mean, even if you've seen them before in seventh grade or whatever, like physics is known in these days, classical mechanics. This course is often known as Newtonian physics because it all stems seemingly from the laws of Newton as that came from a book called the Principia, the Principia Mathematica. Now, what I want to establish right here and now is that Galileo's principle of relativity makes a claim about the laws of physics, but please understand that Ga Newton doesn't even get born until the very year, strangely, that Galileo died. So the laws he's referring to of physics, which we would these days take to be like Newton's laws, they don't even exist yet. Galileo is making a claim here about what the laws will be, will look like, or must look like, or must follow. It's a very bold claim. He's saying no matter what the laws of physics might develop to be, and he's not an idiot, and he knows there's going to be more of them. He's just on the brink of starting to develop them himself. He is saying whatever physics is going to start looking like from here on in, it's going to have to obey this one pre kind of law, this law of laws. This principle is a principle. It's not a law. It's deeper than a law. It's the law from which laws must be written. It, a principle is to laws as uh, of physics as the constitution of the United States is to you know, state legislation or whatever, right? I mean, it, like, right, like, like constitution doesn't tell you what you can or cannot do. It doesn't tell you whether you have to stop at a red traffic light or something like that. The constitution says what kind of laws can or cannot be passed by states and, uh, and municipalities, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then people go to the Supreme Court. And, I, mean, I mean, like, I'm not saying it always works perfectly, but the point is the constitution is a law that governs laws. That's what this principle is. And it is boldly doing that before those other laws even come into play. This is one of the reasons that Galileo is understood to be the father of classical physics. Okay. Um, 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 uh, 
So what does this form say? It says that no matter, it says that we're going to have laws of motion. Physics is about motion, but whatever the laws are, they're not going to change from one motion to the next. They govern, right? Just like regular laws, like the laws of how, you know, the law is that I'm supposed to stop at a red light, then it doesn't change depending on which traffic light we're talking about. Like if it did, then that wouldn't be a law. The point is whatever traffic light it is, if it's red, you stop, or and whatever car it is, right? It, it's not about one driver or another, it's a law. Same thing here, whatever laws end up governing motion, what Galileo is saying was, well, they can't like change just because you speed up, then that wouldn't be a law, right? I mean, it seems almost obvious. Like every other good statement of physics, when you just say it, it hopefully it seems like self-evidently true. What's what's surprising is not the statement. What's surprising is that it turns out that the statement really matters because then we go to the next. And again, I'm just like slightly reviewing here slightly. So then, Okay, what I'm saying here now, and again, I know I said this last time, it's super important. I want, I, want, I want you to see each one of these statements. And what I really want you to see, especially if you sort of heard them last time, and, and then please understand, I mean, these are a law of laws. Like they only get deeper and more clear and more powerful every time you look at them. And honestly, I'm even gonna go farther to say that if anybody who really understands every form of Galileo's principle of relativity, automatically, if they really, really understand it, they can do all the rest of the math and all the rest of physics that's to come. All physics rests on this. And the more you look at it, the more you see it, the more you can on your own see the rest of physics. I mean, it's taken me a long time to see that, but let me put it another way. I never get sick of looking at these, talking about them with people, putting them on the board. So please don't think, oh, we've already written this once, we're covered, like, can we move on? Like, no, like you, you, they, they're, more and more powerful every time we look at them. Um, again, Einstein in 1905 resurrected this idea and said, this is really what physics is all about. Um, and, and he redesigned the physics around this. So there's something very important going on in this idea, in this question of is the earth moving or not? Okay, is the train moving or not? So what Galileo says, Galileo first says, like, imagine just backing up, I mean, there's a lot of reasons Galileo did this, and we can so hopefully get into those maybe or maybe not, or maybe in a different course. I mean, there's a lot of pieces of data and prior work that motivated Galileo to even consider this question as deeply as he did, this question of whether the earth is moving or not. And let me also say again, by the time Galileo comes on the scene, it is a bit of a question. It's not like he's the first person to ever consider the possibility that it might be. But most people thought it did not, because most people did not feel it moving. And in fact, no people felt it moving. Um, some evidence starts to come in that starts to suggest that maybe there is, you know, maybe the earth is not just objectively or absolutely sitting still at the center of the universe. 
I, I have to, I can't resist saying some of the evidence that comes in comes from a telescope that Galileo made and started using that with and, and no he didn't invent the telescope somebody else did but he was an early adopter a super early adopter there were very few telescopes around by the time Galileo had one Galileo did make his own which is fairly impressive in fact shockingly impressive um and what Galileo was was one of the very few people if not the only person to take his telescope and turn it to the sky and start using it to look at things in the sky which allowed him to see things like four to ten times closer than anybody had ever seen the sky before. That is where Galileo is working on his own in a big way. And he kept drawing what he was seeing in the sky very assiduously and very studiously night after night. So he is certainly the first person in, in history of whom we have written record who kept such clear and careful written records of the sky as seen through a telescope, which he made. I mean, in that sense, Galileo is alone in that. So Galileo had, and then he made a book about that very quickly on purpose, because he knew other people were going to, you know, follow suit. So he very quickly got together this book called Starry Messenger, Sidereus Nuncio. Yeah. Um, and he quickly like published this evidence of the sky that he was seeing through his own telescope night after night while drawing, also while drinking very heavily, I might add, but um, um, nobody's perfect. Uh, um, and and he so he had evidence to suggest that this question might require deeper pondering, this question of the structure of the universe. But but his point was not just to ram the evidence down people's throat uh, for a variety of, or he sort of did try to do that, but he was smart enough to know that the evidence alone did, did, was not good enough because no matter how much evidence he could show anybody from the sky, no one still would feel anything under their feet. Like, and again, I can, I, if I'm not careful, I can really get bogged down in all of this. But so Galileo comes forward in the language of Italian and ultimately in the language of Latin and in his book says, okay, in a sense, in, in various different ways to try to reconcile this question of whether the earth is moving or not in some straight up ways and in some satirical backdoor comedic ways he says hold on forget like forget what you're looking at up there forget what you're looking down here let's just talk about motion for a second let's just talk about like what we're going to start calling you know physics from here on in what what aristotle called natural philosophy um, Galileo says, look, so Galileo says, look, whatever physics is, whatever the science of space, time, whatever, I shouldn't even say science because it wasn't really science as such, but whatever the study, the philosophy of space, time, matter is, whatever those laws of motion are going to be, like they, they can't change from one rate of motion to another. If they did, they wouldn't be laws, right? Like something might change from one rate to another for sure. Like if you're going faster, certain things might be different from if you're going slower, like certainly you might see things in a blur when you're going fast and when you're going slow, you don't see things in a blur, like all kinds of things could change. But there's gotta be laws that are deeper than circumstance, otherwise they wouldn't be laws. So whatever the laws governing motion that allow you to go fast in the first place, whatever, they can't change from one motion to the next because then there wouldn't be laws, right? So he says that. So like. And then presumably if you're reading his book at the time where you're you right now, you're like, yeah, okay, right, fine, sure. Especially Galileo, if you're not even specifying what the laws are, if you're just saying whatever the laws are, there's gotta be some that don't change from speed to speed. Okay, presumably we say, yeah, that seems reasonable. The laws won't change from speed to speed. Like who didn't know that? Who, I mean, didn't even Aristotle probably think that even if he didn't think he thought it? Sure, okay. But then Galileo, so that's form number one. And the laws of physics are the same at all constant velocities. Or a better way to put it, sometimes you might want to write this down. We'll get this. An even better way to put it, you can say, is the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. You can say that. I'm worried about myself getting bogged down, so I'm not going to write it that way right now. But if you're faster than I am or you're keeping up or you're getting bored, you, an even more technically sort of powerful way to put this form is the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. Inertial means unaccelerated. Inertial means velocity not changing. Literally, that's what it means. Inertial means neither your speed nor your direction is changing. And a reference frame is a perspective. We're going to talk about that. Technically, a coordinate system. 
a worldview, okay, maintained by someone who views themselves as sitting still. We're going to get more into that. But again, if you're getting bored or if, you, if, I'm, if it's getting too redundant, the real way to write this first form is the laws of physics are the same at all, in all inertial reference frames, in all unaccelerated perspectives. Okay. So, okay. So as long as you're moving at some speed and in some direction, whatever the laws are, they got to be the same to you as anybody else moving at some speed in some direction. As long as you're maintaining your speed and maintaining your direction, the, the law shouldn't change regardless of what direction that is or what speed it is. That's form one, right? Okay. But then form two, now Galileo says, well, and I want you to see, I know I said this last time, but I want you to see this is now form two meaning in my mind, I mean, well, I'm going to write, meaning this directly logically follows from form one. It's sort of new perspective, new information in a way, but it has to be true if form one is true. So let me just make note of that. Like, It's a logical consequence of form one. It's really referring to the same information, but kind of in a more advanced way. It says this, it says no experiment He says something about experiments. Now I'm going to pause right there and say something you've heard in seventh grade or you've heard in high school or you heard in some earlier science course in college. Like, like we've always looked at the natural world. We've all, we people have always tried to make observations and claims about space, time, and the stuff that lives in space. And that people have always been studying, I mean, not every person, but there always have been people who study specifically motion through space and time. And there's always been people that have studied in a very, very advanced, extremely enlightened way and wrote down what they found, such as Aristotle, like in 300 BC. Like, like in no way could we say that, not, that Galileo is the first person to study motion or something, not at all. And Einstein, uh, Einstein Aristotle has a whole book, of, well, one of many, many books, one whole book called The Physics, like which, and of course, it's in Greek, it's not in English, but like Aristotle absolutely studied natural philosophy, studied and thought about how things uh, operate in the natural world, specifically of space, time, and motion. But, but, and, he, and he definitely made observations. He definitely looked, to put it mildly, and he definitely thought hard and did math. He like invented half of math. But when we call Galileo one of the early physicists or one of the early scientists, what when we give Galileo credit for the scientific method, which we do, what we're getting at is that Galileo is one of the first persons, people to write, to, to, doc, to attempt and document a, a precise method for collecting data in a reproducible fashion, collecting data in a reproducible fashion that um, uh, isolates variables. I, I, in other words, experiments, controlled experiments. We credit Galileo with, the, that's what in effect Aristotle and, um, and ancients did not do as such. They looked, they took observations and they drew and they made hypotheses and drew conclusions. But what they didn't really have in the way that Galileo gave us was a method for separating out variables, separating out effects, and collecting data in such a methodical, regularized, controlled way that they could then hand that method to someone else and say, if you don't believe what I, the data that I got, and you don't believe like the conclusions that I came to with the data, here's the recipe. You can do it yourself. It's not just in my head. This is me probing the physical world in a methodical, reproducible, clinical, um, controlled way that is so controlled and clinical and reproducible that like, you don't have to believe me. I'm just like, do the recipe and see what you find. And if you find something totally different, then I'll have to listen because that's how unbiased and scientific I'm being. This idea 
of a controlled reproducible variable separated experiment. This does come from Galileo. He's the one who starts doing it, okay? Then Newton does it as well. And, and, and the subsequent physicists start doing it. That's why we start calling them physicists. We start, we call this the birth of the scientific method in classical physics, where they start doing controlled reproducible data collection. So Galileo starts doing that. And Galileo says, this new thing that I'm doing, this new method, for getting information in a way that, that you don't have to trust my senses and you don't have to trust my brain. Like well, I am using my senses in my brain. I'm not relying on dogma. I'm not relying on just on blind faith or whatever, although I do have much of it if I'm Galileo. Like I am a faithful, religious, God-fearing man if I'm Galileo, which I am. Um, I mean, which I am as Galileo. Um, but uh, I am using my own brain analytical faculties, and I'm using my own senses to collect data, to try to put together the data from my senses with the analytical faculties of my brain to come to some conclusions about the world. And the most important thing about what I'm doing is that I'm using my analytical faculties and my, and my senses in a way that in the end is to, uh, provides a transferable good to you. In the end, it's not about my brain. It's, I mean, this is the nature of experiments, right? It's not about my brain in the end, nor about my senses. It's about this interesting hybrid of the two, this method that then can be given to you and all your people, whoever you are, whether you are apprentices and believers or whether you are skeptics or opposers or doubt or people on the other side or whatever, whatever. Um, here is a method that you can collect the data yourself and you can come to your own conclusion. So in the end, what I'm telling you is here's an access to the external world that is universal. That's what makes it science, right? Okay, I'm getting bogged down again. So Galileo says, now this new thing called an experiment that I'm showing everybody, that I'm, that I'm saying is the reason you should listen to me because it's outside of me. This thing called an experiment, well, I have made many of them. I've, I've used, I've made experiments to come for example, he concludes the rate, the free fall rate of acceleration due to gravity. We're going to get to that, like the 9.8 number that you've heard in high school or early physics classes. The 9.8 number he gets from experiment. He, he, he figures out a lot about pendulums from experiments. We'll do that in 204. He says, the experiments are great, and this is what makes me credible. But guess what? You will never you, any of you, no matter who you are in the future, with whatever laws of physics you have developed, you will never be able to make an experiment or even conceive of, even design an experiment that will tell you whether the earth is actually moving or not. You'll never be able to do an experiment that tells you whether an actual, a single object, I don't just mean any, but I mean single. If you have a single object and you wanna know whether it is actually moving like through space, through the universe in and of itself. If you take a single object, whether it's the earth or that subway train that we hypothetically talked about or some elevator that you might be in, or even just like a pen in your hand, whatever. If I ask the question, is this pen actually moving right now? Like, like or like we asked about the train, is the train actually moving like like through the universe like through space compared to space is the train actually moving if i ask that question there's no experimental way to resolve it let me be more specific like no way not the experiments say yes it is but what galileo is saying is if you're going to look to experiments which we are from here on in because they are they, they become the arbiter of scientific truth Galileo says, uh, if you want an experiment to resolve this question, you ain't going to have one in either direction. Specifically, for example, it, let's say you're on an airplane ride, you're flying to Tokyo, right? And it's like a long flight. So you get all settled, the captain buckles his seatbelts, and it's, or, you know, it says, okay, we're going to lift off, buckle the seatbelts, yada, yada, yada. So you buckle, but then you fall asleep. Cause like that does happen on airplanes, right? And you wake up like a couple hours later and now you literally, you're disoriented. You literally don't know for a minute, like, wait, have we gotten there yet? Have, like, are we like, are we tax? Are we on the runway? Or are we still like mid flight? Like what's going on? What's going on, right? And it all seems smooth and everything because it's an airplane. And let's say, to be clear, let's say you look out the window and you see clouds moving past the window, which, which are like, like the white lights. 
in the train of thought example. So you look out the window and you see clouds going by and you're like, oh, there are clouds moving to the west. So your first instinct might be, oh, I guess the plane is moving to the east, right? But then your next thought may well be, oh, wait a second, do I actually know? I mean, I mean, I guess you would know that you're in the sky from seeing clouds, I suppose. But but your next thought very well could be, maybe even should be, well, yeah, I see clouds moving to the west, but I don't wait. Either that means that the plane is moving to the east, or it could mean that it's like windy and like there's actually clouds moving to the west. Like I don't actually know if I'm actually the one moving and the clouds are actually sitting still or the clouds are actually moving and I'm actually sitting still because planes can't hover, right? I mean, again, maybe I'm making the example too contrived, but again, or again, if you like it better, this could be a train or you could be in a car on a highway and then like the truck starts like moving right next to you. And I personally have definitely had the experience where all of a sudden I look up and like, there's this huge truck going and I'm like, oh no, my foot slipped off the brakes. But actually, no, my foot didn't slip off the brake. It was a truck going, not me slipping back. There can be that moment when you're like, wait, what's actually happening? Is that thing actually moving past me while I'm actually still? And, or am I actually moving while it's actually still? And when we say actually, that's just one of many possible words. But if we like literally want the actual truth, what we're really saying is, hold on, I can definitely tell that there's a comparative motion, right? What we're saying is the evidence is showing me that something is moving past something else. There's definitely motion of one thing in relation to the other. That is not in dispute. But what we were wanting to know when we say, oh, what's actually going on? Or what we think we're resolving in our mind when we might even in one millisecond come to go, oh, no, it's cool, we're not actually moving. What we think we're saying is, forget about this comparison, the comparison is just tricking us, the comparison is just an illusion. What I wanna know is what is the speed or the state of motion or the velocity or whatever of this one object in and of itself? Like, forget the truck, is my car, in and of itself, actually traversing through space, or is the airplane actually moving through space? Forget about the comparison, right? That's what we're saying to ourselves in a way, like, and many of you do with the train, like, yeah, I know that the train is moving relative to the white lights, but the question is, which is actually going on? What I'm, what Galileo is saying is, well, actually, if you want to know actually, if you want to know actually, by which you mean the, the state of motion of a object, by itself, that's what I wrote, single object, like through or compared to space, if that uh, if that's what you want, well, you ain't gonna get it with experiment, that's for sure, is what Galileo is saying. Now, this is kind of deep. And again, I may be belaboring the point, but I don't really think it's possible to belabor this point. Like, let's get it straight. If you wake up on that airplane or on that train, and you have that one moment when you're like, oh, is it moving or not? Or elevator. I mean, come on, elevators, you can never tell whether you're moving in an elevator or not until the door is open. Well, I mean, no, I don't mean that. I mean, you can't tell until it either starts to slow down or it speeds up. But once the elevator is cruising, right, which is a whole constant velocity thing. But once the elevator is cruising past floors, you literally cannot tell. That's like, the, otherwise, people would never get in elevators. They'd be way too scary, right? So what Galileo says is in that moment when it's confusing, when you're confused, what you got to recognize is actually, you're not actually confused. In that moment where you're like, I don't know if I'm actually moving past the floors or what. What Galileo is saying is, how about this? Try doing an experiment. Try doing an experiment, any experiment you want. Come up with a new experiment if you want. Think of it this, what, what does the experiment have to be? It has to be something of the following form. It has to be like, well, I know that if I were just sitting still, I know if I'm just standing in a parking lot, and I drop something, right? It will land below my hand, right? Like, I don't know all the laws of gravity yet. I, as a person, I don't know all the laws of gravity. Galileo didn't know all the laws of gravity. There may be more to come, but I know enough about the law of gravity just as a human being to know that if I'm standing around and I don't do anything special and I just release something from my hand and drop it, it's gonna fall in a straight line and land directly below my hand. That's what happens if I'm just standing around, right? So what I could say to myself in the airplane or in the elevator or whatever, I could say, all right, I'll do an experiment. I'm gonna drop something. And since I know, since I know that if I'm just standing around, the thing is gonna land directly below my hand, then I'll drop it. 
And if it lands directly below my hand, then I guess I'm just standing around and I guess I'm not moving. Like that'll show me whether I'm moving or not. But I'm gonna pause right here and right now for everybody to catch up. But that doesn't work. That sounds like it would work. It sounds like it would work. Well, like you know what would happen if you weren't moving. So just do a thing, anything that you know what would happen. Like, again, you don't have to know all the math. You don't have to know all the laws, but you just know from experimental experience, you know what would happen if you were standing still, say, for example, with dropping something. So I want to ask you guys as a class, I'm going to pause now. I mean, I'm not trying to take anybody off guard, but if you're still, but I know I've been babbling, babbling, babbling. If you've been with me, and even though I kind of said this last time, can anybody tell me why is that a problem? Like why, according to Galileo, that experiment won't work. It won't tell you. Like dropping something won't actually tell you whether you are sitting still or in a vessel that is moving at some really steady, some really high but steady velocity. Like why won't that experiment, for example, dropping something, why will it not actually resolve the question? Like why can you, why on an airplane can you not just drop something and use that to tell whether the airplane is cruising at 5,000, uh, excuse me, at 500 miles an hour or not? Let me say that one more time. And then I'm asking everybody, like either put in the chat, you can put in the direct chat, you can put in public chat, any kind of thought, and this would be for points and all that. Just the question is, oh, well, okay, what be good? I see something in the direct chat. Can you be a little bit more specific? Like what, like what about that? Why won't, I mean, assuming that there's, so I'm not going to mention the person's name, but someone mentioned the word gravity, which is totally cool, but I'm saying let's use gravity. Like we know that when we're sitting still, we drop something. It, and by the way, thank it totally counts also. It's clear you're paying attention. So thank you, direct chat person. I totally appreciate that you're totally right here with me. Um, but I'm saying to everybody, gravity is a good example to consider. I know that if I'm sitting still and I drop something, it will land directly below my hand. Why is that not good enough to then say, okay, so if I'm trying to figure out whether the train, like, why can't I do that in the train of thought? Why can't, if I'm not sure whether the train is moving past the white lights or the white lights are moving past the train, if I'm not sure whether I'm actually moving or not, why can't I just drop something and say, well, if it lands at your feet, like the way it always would, if you were just sitting still, then that shows you're just sitting still. Like, how come that experiment can't resolve the question? How come you can't use an experiment like that? I mean, I mean, Galileo says so, but why does Galileo say so? Why would that experiment not answer the question? I'm looking at the chat. I totally see that video is going to everybody. Yeah, yeah. And there, I think she's totally got it. It's awesome, Rydia. And it is also awesome direct chat person, but no, but... So Rydia, yes, yes, yes. And thank you for going public and thank you for saying that. And this counts as points. Even if I said this is wrong, remember this totally counts as a for right or wrong either way. But also I think this is right. What, what um, to be really specific, therefore, if that object will have the same relative velocity as you and the vehicle have, then therefore what will the object, if I just drop something and say I am in a plane that's going 500 miles an hour and say, I agree with Rydia. And there's a reason I agree with Rydia. She's saying like, well, if you're going 500 miles an hour, like even as you're holding that thing, it's already going 500 miles an hour, like with you. So then if I drop it, if I drop it, even if I'm going 500 miles an hour, as long as I'm going constant, if I drop it, I'm asking Rydia and or anybody else, literally what will the thing do? Like, like, like will it fall directly below my hand? Um, and it would kind of be awesome if Rydia answered, but it could be Rydia or anybody else. Like even if I'm going 500 miles an hour, if I drop something, as long as I'm going constant speed, if I'm in an airplane, if I'm in an airplane and I drop something like above my seat, should it fall in a straight line and land on my seat or should it land like so? Oh, interesting. Okay, here's the deal. Someone in the direct chat just put an answer. I'm not gonna mention name because it's in the direct chat, but it was a very concrete answer. Like I'm asking a yes or no question now and I totally appreciate that someone is seeing I'm asking yes or no question. And I'm gonna be honest and say here that someone in the direct chat actually said no. And so they just got actually like, like 20 points for that because they definitely get points for saying right or wrong. And I'm gonna say right now with total due respect, but this because they get 11 points because no is actually the wrong answer. Okay, but it's like so help, but it's so useful to see that. And it's so gutsy that, so they should submit the person in the direct chat 
should submit this for like a wrong answer, but let, but it's a really important historical wrong. It's not a crazy wrong answer. By putting the answer no, and I'll repeat the question to everybody, but by someone putting the answer no, they just joined the ranks of Aristotle and some of the, and all the great thinkers of all time until Galileo. It's not a crazy answer, but it actually is wrong. Let me say what I'm talking about. I'm saying, and the thing is, I think we actually know from experience this wrong. If we're sitting in an airplane, if you're sitting in an airplane while it's cruising, while like, like, you know, like it's not taking off, it's not landing, it's just like doing its thing. It's going constant speed, constant direction. If you're sitting in an airplane during that time, the reason it's actually safe to unlock your seatbelts and to move freely about the cabin is, and the reason they like serve drinks and like, allow you to watch movies and do all this crazy crap that you do in a hotel room normally, right? The reason it's safe to do all that is, is that it is because you can move freely about the cabin because you all feel as though you're at rest because the laws of physics are still governing you the exact same way they would if you were at rest or at 25 miles an hour or at 70 miles an hour at any speed. The laws of physics are the same, says form one. And that seems like an obvious thing to say in isolation. But what it means here is if you're in an airplane, right? If you're in an airplane and you start walking to the bathroom, right? And you jump up. While you're walking, you're not afraid that the back of the plane is going to slam you in the ass, right? I mean, maybe you do or do not jump, but put another way, if you drop something or if you drop something while you're sitting at your seat, it lands below your seat. It doesn't fly back and hit somebody else, right? Or if someone says, pass the peanuts, you just go, here's the peanuts. You don't go, all right, you ready? Here come the peanuts. Remember, we're going 500 miles an hour. Here come the peanuts, right? Like everybody acts normal because it is normal because the laws of physics are still obtaining, i.e. if you drop, and I'm not yet. Oh. Well, that's a very good question. And I totally see, and I'm glad you were, okay. So in the direct chat, someone said, hold on, are you dropping the pen inside the plane or outside the plane? And now I'm also understanding better why you gave the answer. I'm actually saying inside the plane. I am, I am saying inside the plane. Though you want to know the truth, the crazy truth is it wouldn't even matter if it's inside the plane or outside the plane. As long as the thing were heavy enough not to be too affected by winds, it actually doesn't matter. And I'm going to explain that more. I mean, I'll even put images up in the thing to show you it doesn't matter. But, but, but if that's too hard to swallow, what I'm really saying right now to picture is inside the plane. Inside the plane, if I drop something, it falls straight and it lands below my hand. It, Right, which is the same reason I can lift up something or I can walk freely about why nobody thinks it's dangerous while you're going, because it is as though you were just sitting on earth, because it is the same laws. Go and by the way, the person who's in the direct chat, and I'm not trying, I think it's great what the direct chat person's putting in it, and I'm not trying to argue, I'm trying to use it. And I think that person is speaking for a lot of people who aren't speaking right now. So please, direct chat person, if you could. If you want to close the conversation, I mean, you don't have to close, you can keep talking, but like, if at some point just acknowledge to me whether like I'm pissing you off or I'm making sense to you or whatever. And remember, you're getting points for all of this, what's happening. Because the person in the direct chat said no, because presumably they were picturing that I was saying like, you're standing on top of the plane, dropping something out or something, which does make this all harder to picture. But to be honest, it actually doesn't even act. So it's very fair that they're saying that, but it doesn't actually change what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if we believe that the laws, I mean, Okay, okay, cool. Thank you, thank you. So you just got, so the person in the direct chat just got points for participating, for points for, for right or for wrong, points for being wrong, and points for closing the conversation. Like for real, it's like four portals she can submit and just make, just saying, just saying. And it's helping me because remember, I can just talk to myself all day if I don't, I, I gotta be talking to you guys somehow. Um, so, so what I'm saying is, the reason we get in planes in the first place and that we don't feel totally petrified the entire time, although obviously some of us do, but the reason we start engaging in these bizarrely normal activities like watching movies, having drinks, walking around, like you walk around in a plane, how crazy is that? The reason you walk around in a plane and go to the bathroom in a plane, how crazy is that? And you, and you can literally forget, you act as though you're not moving because you're not in any practical sense of the word. 
The, what Galileo is saying in form number one is no matter what speed you go, zero or 75 or 100 or 500, the laws have to be the same. Therefore, what he's, wait a second, I'm going to look into it. And therefore, I'm going to look in direct time in one second. Therefore, form number two is saying, if you really buy that, if you really buy that the laws are all the same, that means that the reason you often can't tell, the reason you often can't tell if you're moving or not is not a momentary insanity on your part. It's not confusing. It's actual moment of clarity. It's a recognition that the only thing we can tell is the comparative aspect of motion. We can tell if something's moving compared to us. We can tell if we're moving compared to something. But if you want to know whether you're actually moving, you cannot do a physical experiment to collect that data to find out you can't because no matter what experiment you would do, the results will be the same, whether you're going at zero speed, 10 miles an hour speed, 100 miles an hour speed. Like if the laws are really the same, then the experimental results have to be the same no matter what, like, right? If the laws are the same, Whatever the laws are, then if I do X, Y will obtain, if I drop something, if grab, the law of gravity says things fall in a straight line, then if I drop something and expect it to fall in a straight line and land below my hand, that should happen whether I'm going zero miles an hour or 500 miles an hour, as long as I'm not changing. So I'm going at a constant speed, constant direction. That result should be the same. Therefore, even if I'm going 500, if I drop something, it'll land directly below my feet and what that, or my hand, and what that means according to form two, and then I'm going to answer the direct chat, and then I'm going to get to form three, and then we'll just about be done. What that means that's so heavy, like, and, and this is, this is the nature of physics. It's like baby step, baby, each baby step should sort of make sense. Like each step is like, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. But then it leads to this next step. It's like, oh, well, really? Well, yeah, I guess I'm gonna, I never thought of it, but okay. And then at least the next step, and eventually, like we're really at some su surprising things. If we take intuitions or self-evident truths as, as seriously as they deserve to be taken. So in form number two, and I won't forget the direct chat, I'll get to it in a second. I literally, I see it's there, I just haven't read it yet. In form number two, Galileo is saying, dudes, if you believe that the laws are the same at all speeds, then what that has to mean is you literally cannot do an experiment to find out what speed you're going. Because no matter what speed you're going, the experiment's going to give the same result. So there's nothing that like you could say, oh, I know that if I were sitting still, I would drop the pen and it would do this. Therefore, if I drop the pen and do this, I must be sitting still. But no, because even if you weren't sitting still and you dropped the pen, it would still do that because the laws are the same. So you cannot do an experiment to figure out how fast you're actually going in the universe or through space. You literally cannot do, you can't even come up with an experiment, and it's not because technology is limited. Galileo was saying this in 1632, like, it's not that he didn't know about, I mean, he's saying, I don't care what technology anybody ever comes up with, like, if you, if you believe in the laws, then literally, you can't even come up with an idea that would violate this, if this idea is right. That's what form number two says. Let me just look in the direct chat, so if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me just say, right, very, very good. And this also, please get tons of points, blah, blah, blah. Someone else in the direct chat now, and I appreciate this. And again, I mean, I think ultimately it's like, anyway, I don't care if it's direct or not. It might be ultimately a little bit better for everybody when it's not direct. And maybe I'll start giving a portal for that. But look, these things in the chat are showing me that you guys are with me. And frankly, the more challenging these things are in the chat to me, like the more they're like, hold on, wait, all uh, right. Hey or even just disagreeing or whatever, the more I do think I'm getting across. Because if you all just think this is a completely obvious idea and it's just like, yawn, 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 I, then I would suggest maybe you're not paying. Like, this is a weird idea and it goes farther and farther as we go. You're right to make sure you're getting it as we go. Um, and again, don't forget, like Galileo was practically burnt at the stake for this. I mean, he wasn't ultimately burnt at the stake. He was ultimately put under house arrest for the rest of his life as a compromise because of how crazy or at least revolutionary this whole view was. He was under, he spent the rest of his life under house arrest. The only other person in history that I know of who had to spend considerable amount of, amount of time under house arrest was Martha Stewart. I mean, like, like this is not an easy idea to just swallow. And that, by the way, also the people that put him under house arrest were not dummies. And they weren't just like little weakling cowards who are like, eh, we want to keep thinking what we're thinking. We're not listening. To they were smart people. I mean, they obviously had a different view from his. But like, like, so it's not crazy to not totally accept this idea or totally feel comfortable with it right away or maybe even not know if you're missing something or not. But anyway, in the direct chat, someone else is saying, so wait, so someone's saying in the direct chat, so if we were on top of the plane at the same velocity, 
and there were no winds or anything and we dropped a pen, it would go straight down. Like you're saying, Yaverbaum, is that what you're saying? That's what, and that's a very, very challenging, like perfect question. Like, am I really saying that? And yes, I am. And can I actually, like, I am saying that winds affect things. I mean, and by wind, I mean air that's moving. I mean, like that is like, if you're on an airplane and you're cutting through the air, then now air is cutting past you. So if on the outside of the airplane, so if you drop things, if they're like a feather or, or a light pen or something like that, they are gonna be affected by the winds and that doesn't change what I'm saying at all. It just makes it harder to see what I'm saying. But as long as you drop something that's heavy enough that is not overly affected by winds, then this is totally is true. And that's not a hypothetical. Let me give you a specific example. And I think I'm gonna pause for a second to even bring up a Google image or I'll, if I don't show it to you right now, I'll show you another time. If the thing that you drop out of the airplane isn't just like a little pen, but is say a bomb, and that's a realistic example, like say the plane is a bomber, like from World War II or something like that. It's not a pleasant example, but it's a very, very real example. Um, if the plane drops a bomb, oh yes, the bomb will continue to fall directly below the plane. What do I mean by that? I mean, if, you, if a plane drops a bomb, the bomb will continue to go forward while it falls at the same rate that the plane will go forward, which is exactly what we're talking about here, right? This goes back to, I think it was, someone said, I think it was, uh, who, someone said in the public chat. Yeah, Rydia, right? This goes back to Rydia's point, like, make no mistake, if I'm sit, and this is where we get to the relative character velocity, like the last thing I'm going to say, oh, I have three minutes, I'm going to have to write it down in a second. But, but I'm saying, if you really believe that where we're going with this, then if I'm in the plane and I drop a pen, the reason the pen would land directly below my hand, like at my feet, right, is that the pen is like part of the plane. The whole plane is going forward. The plane is, uh, my feet are going forward. My hand is going forward. And the pen will also, as it drops, will continue to go forward just like everything else in the plane, like, like relative to the earth. But therefore, since it will say, do the same thing as everything else, relative to everything else, it will stay still. The plane, in other words, the pen will drop in a straight line from my perspective, because if you were to look from the outside, if the whole plane were to be glass or like a Wonder Woman, like transparent plane, if you were to watch from the outside, you would see a pen falling down and falling forward as it fell. And it, right, like, and it would land at my feet. That, that is what I'm saying. And therefore I'm even saying, even if you did it outside the plane, as long as the object were heavy enough, like a bomb, absolutely, if you dropped a bomb, it would continue to move forward underneath the plane. We're gonna get back to this. And therefore, when the bomb like hits the ground, when it hits the ground, it'll hit the ground exactly like, like the, it'll hit the ground at a place that the plane is right over it when it hits the ground. If you, if, so it's all a matter of perspective, but yes, I'm saying the, the bomb will land directly below the plane when it lands, it won't fly backwards and it won't fly forwards relative to the plane. It will fall in a straight line relative to the plane to the point where if you drop a whole succession of them, you can look this up in Google images right now. If you just type into Google images right now, B-52 bomber or whatever, you'll see images all over Google of airplanes with a whole bunch of bombs below the plane and they're all in a straight vertical line. Like while the plane's flying, they don't like trail back the way we would expect. They all stay with the plane. That is totally what I'm, it's a great question, but it is exactly what I'm saying. Now, hold on. Um, right, now again, sky, and now someone put in the direct chat, what about skydiving? Yeah, I'm saying, now again, skydiving uh, deliberately tries to take advantage of the wind and the air, like skydiving works because you're trying to capture the air and use it as a force. So then the air can start making other motions and complexities. But other than that, yes, uh, skydiving. Hold on, since we have two minutes, let me just, or wait, one minute. And also there's a, well, anyway, I'll, there's a book on this that I recommend anybody, that you could find on Amazon. Well, anyway, well, I'll get to that. But um, form three, there's the last thing and then we'll go. So what this all means though, if you're, and I think you guys are getting, I appreciate all the different questions in the direct and public chat. I think you are with me. It seems like you are. Then what this all means though is, and I'll write this really quick and then that's it. And if you have to go right now, then you have to go, you can get the notes. Form three then is, if, if form two says no experiment could ever show, 
an absolute velocity of a single object. Experiments could only show comparative relational velocities between pairs of objects. Then Galileo says, well, from here on in, like, like physics is an experimental science. We, are in, we only can believe in physics, what we find in experiment. We can, there are other truths in life, but you find them in philosophy or religion or emotion or psychology or whatever. But if from now on what science is or what physics is, is that which comes from data collected in experiments, then if we can't find it in an experiment, then we can't call it truth in physics. Therefore, from now on, form three is And this is the last thing I'm gonna write, just bear with me and we're done. Velocity of a This says, I'll just read it and we're gone. And once you get this, then go. Thank you. I mean, I'll hang out for questions, but the velocity of a single object through space is meaningless. There's no such thing in physics. You could talk about it in philosophy if you want. Like we know what we mean. You know, oh, is the earth actually moving in the universe or is the sun actually moving? You could talk about that like historically, but scientifically there's, if we can't find that idea in an experiment, then that idea does not exist. It doesn't do anything for us in science. So from here on in, in science and physics, Velocity is never ever from here on in, it's never a property that a single object has. It is a relation between two objects. Velocity from here on in necessarily is a comparison. This is what me, people say mean when they say the relational quality of velocity or better when people say the relativity of velocity or when they talk about relativity, they're saying velocity is only meaningful when it's discussed relatively. You can have the velocity of one thing relative to another. You can have the velocity of the earth relative to the sun or the velocity of the sun relative to the earth or the velocity of the moon relative to the earth. But you can't just have the velocity of the earth. There's just no such thing. How fast is the earth moving? Well, it is moving zero relative to itself. It's moving 65,000 miles an hour relative to the sun. It's moving 650,000 miles an hour relative to the galactic center. And all of those answers are just as legitimate as all the other answers. Velocity is not a property of a single object. It's a relation between two objects. End of story. Sorry to keep you. I think you guys, I think you get it. I think you're good. Um, I'll hang out for a question for a second, but I'm turning off the recording and thank you so much and you can go and goodbye. Uh, so thank you. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.